how many of you would not have heard of the Sino-British Joint Declaration? But how many of you really know what it is supposed to be? Now, people think that the Sino-British Joint Declaration was an agreement between China and Britain over Hong Kong. Have you ever thought that it was also meant for China? The one country two systems policy on the face of it was for Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, but it was actually also for China. How do I know? In 1984, on the 29th of December, on the 19th of December, there was a very important meeting between Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister of Great Britain and Zhao Jiang and Margaret, uh, and uh, in fact, with um, Tang Xiaoping, Zhao Jiang was all there. And I know that because this document, uh, this is a minute of that meeting, kept by the British side and was released after 30 years. So it was released in December two years ago. And that document recorded this conversation between Deng Xiaoping and Margaret Thatcher. Deng said, why 50 years? He said, our Japanese friends asked us, why 50 years? And he said, 50 years was actually chosen by us because we reckon that it would take us 50 years to catch up with the successful economies of the world. So you don't have to worry about it. It is in our interest to keep our promises contained in the Joint Declaration. As for the end of the 15-year period, you should even have less reason to worry about it, because by then, we, that is the successful economic powers of the world, will depend on each other. At that time, in the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping just decided to open up China for overseas investments. He was obviously looking at Hong Kong. He was obviously, he has obviously decided not to pursue this uh, socialism. He wanted to bring China along the capitalist <coughs> road. Because if you look at China today, where is the socialism? Where is communism? But he didn't say it. This Deng Xiaoping was very clever. He just called it socialism with Chinese characteristics. And then he was able to practice capitalism. They even pride themselves of having a market economy. So he wanted to follow the Hong Kong example. And he wanted Hong Kong to bring China forward. Remember the four modernization programs at the time? Hong Kong was the engine which was supposed to lead China forward. Now that was his design. Why 50 years? He wanted Hong Kong to remain what Hong Kong was with our rule of law, with our freedoms, the successful economy, level playing field, so that China would have 50 years to catch up with us. Then, when we were drafting the Basic Law in 1987, Deng Xiaoping summoned us, and I was a member of the drafting committee on the Basic Law, and he gave us a talk. And he said, if 50 years should prove not to be enough, you can have another 50. Why? Because if in 50 years time, China still could not catch up with us, rather than to bring us down for a complete conversion of one country, one system, he would rather postpone it for another 10 years and China could then catch up in another 50 years. <coughs> that was his blueprint. Not just for Hong Kong, but for China. That's what Hong Kong's role should have been. But unfortunately, it isn't. Now, what has gone wrong? 
Einstein will tell you all the changes that were, that were supposed not to have taken place. But I, because of time constraints, I will bring myself forward. You remember the Tiananmen Square massacre. You remember some of you, there was a massive demonstration in Hong Kong in 2003 on the 1st of July when we celebrated the 6th anniversary of Hong Kong becoming part of China. Three and a quarter millions of people turned up in opposition to a piece of legislation under Article 23 of the Basic Law which had, it would, when that bill, if that bill had been passed, it would have reduced three of our basic human rights. But because of the opposition from the Hong Kong people, the bill was then postponed and finally withdrawn. So even now, we don't have that law. And more recently, of course, many of you would have seen our young people taking part in what has been called the umbrella movement. Umbrellas were used to protect themselves from the police using pepper spray on them. But they never hit the policemen. You, you, you saw that all on television. The police fired rounds and rounds of tear gas at the people. And the people ran away because you had to. It's awful. I got the first one. People brought me away and poured water on me and they completely recovered. But the police never attacked us with a baton. <coughs> it's generally believed that Xi Jinping gave orders mm. that there mustn't be any bloodshed. Mm. Now, and then more recently, there is a mention about the elections. It, it has never happened before in Hong Kong. I don't think that it would have happened anywhere else in the world with democratic elections. Where young people were elected into the legislature who had no record whatsoever to show for it. They did not even have the support of parties. And yet they got themselves elected. Why? Mm -hmm. It was because a professor, you know that guy by name, Benny Tai, who was one of the, well, the Occupy Central was his brainchild. He came up with a suggestion. He said, guys, don't vote early. Wait for us, we'll tell you who are the prospective winners in the democratic camp, and then vote for them. And then they advise people, all right, vote for these two here, yeah. vote for these two here. Yeah. So how come people just listen then? Yeah. And voted accordingly. And they didn't care who these guys were, except that they were from the democratic camp, except that they knew that they had a reasonable chance of success. And that's how, that's how it happened. Now, and some of you might have noticed that recently in Hong Kong something very funny happened. <coughs> There was a pro-Beijing newspaper hitting and strongly attacking another two pro-Beijing newspapers. And they were going like that. Why? The Thai Kong Wai Wei Pao represented the, and the also the liaison office in Hong Kong. They represented communists. The communists in Hong Kong. But then there's Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office which is part of the Chinese government, responsible for Hong Kong affairs. <coughs> it's a fight between them. It's interesting. That suggests to me, and I will elaborate later on, we have more time, that suggests to me that things are going to happen in Hong Kong which may take everybody, take a lot of people by surprise. And that is, it is possible that Xi Jinping wants to change the direction that Hong Kong had been run, or has been run, all these 19 years. Now, I'm the most optimistic person in Hong Kong, right? But, and I could be wrong. And so, when you look at Hong Kong, think that there is a possibility, there is a possibility that Xi Jinping will correct the departure from Deng Xiaoping's blueprint, <coughs> and hopefully, but it might not happen that way. <laughs> now, the important thing is, it is in China's interest 
to change course. Because Xi Jinping finds himself as a leader of the world's second largest economy. What is he going to do with it? Can China survive without depending on the other strong economies of the world? Remember Deng Xiaoping said, we would depend on each other. If China were to provoke the other large economies of the world to gang up against China, how can that lead to a successful, successful China? So what I suggest, ladies and gentlemen, is that it is in the interest of the international community to look at China that way, hoping that Xi Jinping will bring about changes. And the best place to begin is Hong Kong, because of these promises already made to us of democracy, written into the basic law already, but postponed three times already. So it is so easy for any government which supported and still supports the one country, two systems, to say to China, what's happening in Hong Kong? <coughs> because if China were to begin to do the right thing in Hong Kong, then there is at least a good chance, a reasonable chance that China will continue to correct her own ways rather than to bully the rest of the world. China can never succeed in bullying the rest of the world. So it is in China's interest to change and to go back to Deng Xiaoping's ways and to cooperate with the rest of the world rather than to try to exert pressure on them and rather than to bully them. And the proper place to begin with is Hong Kong. And I, I think you guys are with me. I mean, look at the prominence of Hong Kong. It's almost bigger than China. <laughs> so that's the importance you attach to Hong Kong. That's the importance that Dan Xiaoping attached to Hong Kong. Well, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all very much for being here and giving Martin and myself an opportunity to talk about what's happening in our part of the world. Next year marks the 20th anniversary of the Handover. Next year is also going to be an important year insofar as Hong Kong is concerned, and that is that we will be electing our next chief executive in March of the year 2017. To many of us in Hong Kong, there is actually not much to celebrate on this 20th anniversary. And I will go on to explain why. After the reversion of sovereignty in 1997, Hong Kong is supposed to be governed in accordance with the Joint Declaration and the Basic Law, which promises the people of Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy, Hong Kong people who live in Hong Kong, Hong Kong will have its own social, economic, and political systems separate from those in the mainland. We will have the rule of law, a truly independent judiciary, <coughs> a squeaky clean civil service, and protection of our basic rights and freedoms, of which the more important freedoms are freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, of religion, freedom of the press, free flow of information and academic freedom. I want to give you a flavor of why we in Hong Kong are increasingly concerned about the steady erosion of one country to systems, both overt and covert. And I'd like to do this by referring to some of the main pillars of an open civil society, a pluralistic society that Hong Kong people had always taken pride in and believed it to be protected under the guarantees made by Beijing, in, both in the Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. So let me first of all take a look at press freedom. Press freedom is important not only to Hong Kong people because it must act as an adequate check and balance against executive power and against absolute power. 
but it's also, I suggest, very important in providing a conducive business environment. That is, after all, one of the attributes that attract foreign investors, including Australian investors, to Hong Kong. In the year 2002, if you look at the index of press freedom compiled by the uh, Reporters Without Frontiers, Hong Kong was number 18. In the year this year, we have fallen to number 69. I would say that in Hong Kong today, if you look at the local press, there is really only one newspaper that is truly independent, and that is Apple Daily, owned by Jimmy Lai. And that is simply because Jimmy has deep pockets. But even his deep pockets are not going to last very long if he is continuously starved of the newspaper's main source of income, which is advertisement. Apple Daily used to be this thing. A lot of it is advertisements. It's now <coughs> dwindled down to this. Why? Because with the money at the disposal of the liaison office, which is one of the representative offices of central government in Hong Kong, and probation supporters, they have been able to twist the arms of business people, including international banks, to lift their advertisements from Apple Daily. So I'm not sure how much longer even Apple Daily can survive. Some of the more vocal critics, whether they are political commentators on radio uh, or television, uh, are summarily dismissed. We've seen attacks against reporters, one or two of them particularly vicious. The press today is certainly not free. There is increasing self-censorship. <clears throat> you look at TVB, which is the only free-to-air television broadcasting station in Hong Kong. It, is, it has turned into just a mouthpiece of London. At the height of the election, to the Legislative Council, when some of the candidates withdrew their candidacy in order to improve the chances <coughs> of some of the other pan-democratic candidates, TPP did not even bother to report this as a matter of fact. So little wonder that we are increasingly concerned about the state of health of our media. You look at the annual reports of the Hong Kong Journalists Association. Every year, the level of confidence in Hong Kong's press decreases. And there is concern particularly over self-imposed self-censorship. Secondly, you look at um, academic freedom, which is one of Hong Kong's core values, and which is another freedom that is protected under the basic law. Some of you may have read about the, um, the, the particular incident at Martin and I, alma mater, which is Hong Kong University. And the whole incident revolved around Professor Yuanus Chen, who stepped down as the dean of the law faculty of the Hong Kong University. He was the teacher of Mr. Ben Tai, who was one of the main architects of the Occupy Central movement. For several months on end, the left-wing press unleashed an orchestrated smear campaign against Joannes Chen, wrote something like 350 articles, denigrating him, fabricating lies about him. Now, anybody who knows Joannes, and both Martin and I know him very well, Joannes has been a long-time member of my little thing can group. You cannot find a more <laughs> moderate person than Joannes. He did not support the Occupy Central Movement, one of the offenses of which he was accused. But like any reputable academic, he wrote articles analyzing the pros and cons of what is known as civil disobedience, as he rightly should. This just gives you an indication of the pervasiveness of the Communist Party's propaganda machinery in Hong Kong. 
and the way they systematically now infiltrate into every level of Hong Kong society, including the government, including academic institutions increasingly, NGOs, traditional clansmen's associations, and the hold that they have over the press. Look at education. Now, before I leave the university, I have to point out one legacy of the colonial government, which has not served us well. In the colonial days, the governor appointed by the queen was automatically the chancellor of all the universities in Hong Kong. But his role was largely ceremonial. And I know for a fact, because I was in the government for almost equal periods before the handover and after the handover. He had power, but he used them very, very sparingly. The difference today is that the chief executive is still automatically the chancellor of all universities in Hong Kong, but he is determined to use his power to the hilt and sometimes beyond that to get his wish. It's not just the systematic denigration of Professor Yuan as chair, but when all the stakeholders of Hong Kong University, including alumni members like myself and Martin, including current students and current staff members, overwhelmingly saying that they had no confidence in Arthur V as the chairman <coughs> of the university's council. The chief executive totally ignored popular sentiment and promptly appointed him as the chairman of the university council. And he has other powers to appoint members to the senate, to the council. So this does not all go well for academic freedom and institutional autonomy. Because if Hong Kong University falls, then all the other universities will quickly follow suit. On the wider front on education, several years ago, you may have read of Joshua Wong and his student colleagues spearheading a campaign against the introduction of so-called national education into our schools. The so-called national education was nothing more than brainwashing material, louding the good that the communist one-party system was doing in China, and denigrating democracy in America. Of course, Hong Kong people, particularly parents and teachers, took strong objection to the introduction of such material. Education, after all, whether in primary, secondary schools, and particularly in universities, should be about opening up people's minds, encouraging critical thinking, and allowing people to think for themselves and make decisions for themselves. All of these, we thought, were promised in the Joint Declaration. And it was Joshua Wong and his student colleagues who in a matter of a few days managed to summon 100,000 people to take the streets, which in turn forced the Hong Kong government to withdraw this national education curriculum. And lastly, let's talk about universal suffrage. If you look at our basic one, China actually envisaged that within 10 years after the handover, which is in the year 2007, Hong Kong people should be able to decide for themselves how fast to move towards genuine universal suffrage, one man, one vote. But interpretation by the Standing Committee of the NPC threw all that out. But at least they promised Hong Kong people in the year 2017, which is next year, you can, on the basis of one man, one vote, elect the chief executive, and by the year 2020, you can, again, on the basis of one man, one vote, elect all members of the legislature. Currently, our legislature, only half of the legislative <coughs> council are actually elected by universal suffrage. The other half are elected through functional constituencies, which perpetuate the hope that a small group of vested interested parties can have over entire proceedings in the legislative council. And in terms of the election of the chief executive, next year, we are still settled with a small election committee of 1,200 people, largely dominated by Beijing supporters, against a potentially qualified electorate of over 5 million people in Hong Kong. So Martin and I and sundry others have no right 
to elect our chief executive. We do not know how long we will have to wait for universal suffrage. But we are certain of one thing, and that is that if you wish to see effective government in Hong Kong, then you must have a chief executive who has the political legitimacy and the political mandate to govern, which he doesn't have. On top of that, he has adopted the policy of, you are my friends, or these are my enemies, and the two will never meet. And that is why people perceive us to have a dysfunctional legislative council, where you force the pan-democratic cabinet, or some of the members of the pan-democratic cabinet, to resort to filibustering in order to thwart unpalatable legislation because you have a chief executive who is determined not to listen to public sentiments. So let me finish with why we are here and why we think Australia and the rest of the world should pay some attention to what's happening in our corner of the world. Australia has 90,000 Australian nationals living in Hong Kong. You have long sustained vested interests in the success of one country, two systems in Hong Kong. Because the links between Hong Kong and Australia are built not just on trade and investment, but on people to people links. So you have a stake in seeing the success of one country, two systems. And I think you should, could learn from what we are experiencing in Hong Kong. And you should look at Hong Kong as a barometer of the sort of China that you are currently dealing with and the sort of China that you would like to deal with in the future. Let's face it, China is an economic powerhouse that nobody in the world can afford to ignore. But Australians, Americans, the British, and the EU people have to work out for themselves on what terms you are prepared to engage with China. Trade and investment is not a one-way street. It is a two-way street. And to the extent that we share Australians' values, then we think it is as much in Australia's interest as it is in Hong Kong's interest that you should see China honoring its international treaty obligations to the world and particularly to the people of Hong Kong. We all want to see a great China. I want to see my country becoming strong. But I think what defines a country is not just economic might or even a growing military might. It is the way in which its leaders choose to treat its own people, particularly the more vulnerable members of the community. And I want to see the success of one country, two systems as a basis for China earning its rightful place in the world.